This is the first video in a series of six where I'll go through all 60 questions from the national exam in the Chemistry Olympiad 2017. Uh, you can find the exam in the description if you want to try it first and then follow along and see how you did. So the first question here is about lithium. It's a reaction with water to form lithium hydroxide. Our reaction for that is going to be lithium plus water. It's just going to turn into lithium hydroxide hydrogen gas. It's going to be a 2, a 2, a 2, and a 1 to balance all of that. So when we compare the lithium hydroxide with the lithium, which is what's asked of us, so we're looking at how much lithium hydroxide based on lithium. We're looking at a 1 to 1 mole ratio or 2 to 2. So when we give this, when we're given 12 grams of lithium hydroxide, what we're basically tasked to do is turn 12 grams of lithium hydroxide into moles, into moles of lithium back into grams. Um, so quickly, we're going to divide this by 23.95, get this into moles. This ends up being 0 0.501 moles of lithium hydroxide, which means that we would have 0 0.501 moles of lithium metal required to produce that much. Multiply that by the molar mass of lithium, 6.941, and we get 3.48 grams, which rounds to be B, 3.5 grams. Okay, so just a regular, simple stoichiometry problem to start things off. Okay, number two, we're going to scale it up a little bit. Uh, we're looking at combustion of one gram of a hydrocarbon. Uh, it gives us some name that we're not familiar with, and it gives us the amount of carbon dioxide. So, Hydrocarbon, you want to be wary. Is it just carbon and hydrogen, or is there also oxygen? There's nothing about water in this case, and so that, that inclines us to think that it's probably going to be about those two, but we want to be a little suspicious. So the only information we're given is this 3.38 grams of carbon dioxide, so let's do something with that. So what I would do first with this is turn that into moles. So that ends up being 0 0.0768 moles of CO2 which means that our original one gram of hydrocarbon had 0 0.0768 moles of carbon in it because all of that carbon was used to produce the CO2. So in our original compound, let's switch colors for that. So we had 0 0.0768 moles of carbon. And then if we figure out the mass of that, we can compare that to our one gram. So this ends up being 0.922 grams of carbon. And, and for one gram, 0.92 of it is carbon, that's the very little left is hydrogen. So we can assume then that we're probably correct that we could ignore the oxygen. So 0 0.078 grams of hydrogen. And hey, would you look at that? So we have 0 0.0768 moles of CO2, so 0 0.077, 0 0.078 moles of hydrogen. Okay, or 0.077, I don't know exactly what it comes out to, but we're basically looking at a one to one mole ratio of carbon to hydrogen one carbon for every one hydrogen. We can then conclude that we're probably correct and we're looking at an empirical formula for A. Is that correct? Okay. okay, and we've quickly scaled up into a lot more challenging questions. So the next one, we have a binary. So binary meaning two things. We have the metal and the chloride. So we have some kind of metal in it. And to make this a little trickier, we have copper, which could be plus one or plus two, cerium, which I don't know the charges of, cadmium, I think is plus two, and thorium, plus two, plus four, I'm not really sure. So we don't really know what our charge of our metal is, so we kind of have to work around that and figure that out. So let's, let's do this. So first of all, we have 10 grams of metal and chlorine. 6.207 grams is the metal. And M is just whatever unknown metal. We're doing like the variable M. So what we do know is we do know that the rest of it is the is the chlorine because there's no nothing about a hydrate or anything like that. So we're going to have 3.793 grams of chlorine. Well, we can figure out the moles of that. So we're going to divide that by 35.45, and that comes out to be 0 0.107 moles of chlorine. Okay. So what I did from there was I assumed well let's assume it's just a one to one ratio and see how that works out. So I'm going to assume that 0.107 moles is how many moles of the, of the metal I have. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to adjust it by some factor of 2, 3, or 4. Okay. So what I did, what I did is I said, okay, 6.207 grams of the metal. I'm going to assume that it's 0.107 moles. So under that assumption that it could be wrong, this gives me a molar mass. So I went through, and the, that molar mass was about 58 grams per mole. Okay, so I checked copper real quick. That's not 
it's a 63 point something, so it's not that. So that means, and this was the lightest one of all. So that means now I have to go through and think, okay, what if it was plus two? What if it was plus three? What if it was plus four? So if the metal is plus two, plus three, plus four, I'm looking at something where it's an MCL2 or an MCL3 or an MCL4, okay? In the case that it's MCL2, now I'm looking at half this amount of moles and therefore double the molar mass. So I would look at a molar mass of 116. If it's triple, then it's gonna be uh, 174. And if it's quadruple, then we're looking at a case where we got 232. So then we wanna check those and see if they match any of these particular compounds in a charge that makes sense for them. And the one that works out is thorium at a four plus charge with a molar mass of 232, or atomic mass of 232, and therefore D was our correct answer for that. There are other ways you could figure that out, but that worked out pretty simply for me once I kind of got rolling with it. Okay, on to number four, uh, one gram of the following compounds. This one you actually don't want to carry through any calculations. You want to look at how much nitrogen you have and how much other stuff you have. So here I have assuming one mole of each compound, 14 grams of nitrogen, and I've got 16 grams of other stuff, okay? Here I've got 14 grams of nitrogen versus 32 grams of other stuff. Here I've got the same ratio as this one, so NO2 and N2O4 are gonna give the same percent compositions, right? We're looking at an empirical formula and a molecular formula, even if these are both molecular formulas, but they'll have the same percent composition breakdown. That kind of right there tells us that these are not gonna be the answers. Uh, this is going to be a ratio of 28 to 64 grams. And then the last one is 14 grams of nitrogen and 3 grams of other stuff. So the question is, which one will give us the most nitrogen gas? Well, the one that has the largest amount of nitrogen compared to the other stuff will have the greatest percentage of nitrogen, and therefore one gram will give us the most nitrogen gas. gas excuse me. And that's very clearly going to be D here because we have so much more nitrogen than anything else. So we don't have to do any calculations, we're just good rationalizing that and moving on to the next question. Okay, so here we have a redox titration. We're, look, we're looking at permanganate reacting with peroxide under acidic conditions. And it gives us some information here, 35 milliliters, 0.15 molar KMnO4, and then it gives us 50 milliliters of the unknown concentration of peroxide. What's the concentration of peroxide? So the critical calculation you need to know for this is you need to know off the top of your head that molarity times volume is equivalent to moles. And it needs to be molarity and molarity and volume in liters for that to function, but, but we need to use that quickly to kind of go ahead and work this problem through reasonably. So if we go through and look, 35 milliliters uh, is 0 0.035 liters, don't forget the zero. Okay, so 35 milliliters is 35 out of 1,000 times 0.15 molar tells us the moles of permanganate. So that ends up being 0 0.00, I have 525 moles here of permanganate. Then we want to apply the mole ratio of two to five. So every two of those will react with five peroxides. So our peroxide moles that have reacted in this case is five halves times this number. So we can then do a little stoichiometry here come up with the fact that we must have reacted with 0 0.013125 moles of peroxide. And we can round that later. And then all we need to do is divide that by the liters to get that in concentration. So 0 0.050 liters, 0 0.500, sorry. Uh, and so we end up with a final answer of 0 0.0263, which was C. Okay, so that problem is actually really straightforward. As long as you know to go to this immediately, that's gonna show up in titrations, any kind of dilution concentration type stuff. Uh, you wanna have that kind of in your back pocket. Okay, on to number six, uh, we're looking for which one will show the greatest freezing point depression, and it's 10 grams in 100 grams of water. So the critical thing we're looking at here, 10 grams of any of these four substances, all in 100 grams of water. So freezing point depression depends on two things, your concentration and molality, and it also depends on your Van Hoff factor. I is the thing that we use in a while. Uh, so, so for instance, magnesium sulfate, our Van Hoff factor is two, because this will dissociate into a magnesium ion and a sulfate ion, as long as we don't have too concentrated of a solution. 
Uh, in this one, our Van Hoff vector is also two, and the water will just go off in the solution, and the magnesium and the sulfate will dissociate. But the sodium thiosulfate will produce two sodium ions and one thiosulfate. And so therefore, this is going to have a greater impact. Uh, it's gonna produce more ions for the same number of moles, okay? So we also need to look at molar mass to figure out, well, is 10 grams of magnesium sulfate you know, gonna be significantly more or less than the sodium thiosulfate. Okay, first thing I did though in this problem was I eliminated B and D. So if we're looking here, if we have 10 grams of this and 10 grams of this, 10 grams of this has an appreciable quantity of water, and therefore we don't have as much of this chemical to uh, depress the freezing point. And so therefore, because of that hydrate formula, we know that D is going to have a, a smaller effect than C, and we know that B is gonna have a smaller effect than A, and then we, we can simplify it down to just A and C. Okay, from there, we need to look at molar mass. So magnesium sulfate had a molar mass of 120.4 approximately grams per mole. And the sodium thiosulfate was approximately 158 something grams per mole. Okay, and I'm looking at a ratio of three to two here. So I have a greater molar mass. That means I'm gonna have fewer particles, or not fewer particles, but rather fewer uh, formula units but am I going to have enough fewer that the three is not going to override that? And that's not the case here. So if we think of 120, half of that is 60. So we're looking at this needs to be 180 grams per mole to give us essentially the same thing. So with a smaller molar mass, this is going to produce a greater number of moles, not greater than the actual amount of magnesium sulfate, but when we factor in the three to two ratio, it's going to exceed the effect. So if we actually want to go through and do a calculation on that, Instead of kind of hand waving about it, what we would do is we would say, okay, you have 10 grams, we're going to multiply that by 1 over 120.4, and then we're going to multiply that number of moles by 2. And then we're going to compare that with 10 grams times 1 over the molar mass of 158, and we're going to multiply that one by 3. So we are dividing by a greater number, we have fewer moles, but that factor of 3 to 2 ends up where C is the best answer for that particular one. Okay, on to number seven, we are looking at a qualitative one. So, solution of barium hydroxide mixed with iron chloride. Our two products are going to be barium chloride and iron three hydroxide. So, iron three hydroxide is, of course, rust colored, yellowish orange, and it's precipitate, it's insoluble. All the hydroxides are insoluble with the exception of the alkali and some of the alkaline. Barium chloride is soluble. So, those are the two things we have going on. Iron and, and to a smaller extent barium, iron is relatively acidic. Um, so in here they have evolution of a colorless gas, and that is a potential possibility because of the acidity of that, but I don't see anything really that it's gonna react with, so I wanna look at the other ones too. Uh, so here we have precipitation of a colored solid, that's true, that's our iron hydroxide. Precipitation of a colorless solid, that is not true solid would be in the first place, and I feel like glass, right? Uh, and then neither precipitation nor gas evolution, we know that's not true. So really we're comparing these two, and at that point I go, well, A has a clear answer, C really doesn't, and so therefore A is the best answer. Okay, which element is a liquid? There's a gimme on a National Chemistry Olympiad exam, that would be bromine. Uh, it's the orange liquid, chlorine and gas, iodine is solid, and fluorine, of course, a gas. Not sure what that was meant to do. All right, and then we move on to nine. Um, which one could be most accurately determined using a spectrophotometer? So lead nitrate is colorless. Zinc nitrate is colorless. Both of those you should know about because of the d orbital splitting. We have 3D10, so completely filled D shell, so we don't get into those electronic transitions. And then this is lead two plus, so we also have a filled, what, five D shell, four D shell. Uh, so manganese and cobalt, on the other hand, both have that d orbital splitting, both have the ability to absorb visible light. So, so this is a slight pink color. Uh, and sometimes to the point where you don't really see it. And sometimes I think it's clear and colorless. And then this cobalt can be blue, it can be uh, pink, it can be kind of a blend of the two, purple, depending on what's around it. Uh, it can get into some other things. So at that point, I went, well, I know this is definitely very colorful. This is sometimes slightly colorful and sometimes not, depending on what it's with. Therefore, B is the better answer of the two choices. I went with that and then ended up getting marked correct. 
and for 10, uh, which one of these is the most acidic? So aluminum nitrate is the correct answer. Aluminum ions are small and highly charged, and that allows them to interact with a water molecule in a way where we form a ligand interaction. So a pair of electrons forms a bond here, and that can weaken these two bonds, allowing an H plus to be removed. So small, highly charged cations can, can cause acidity in a solution, and aluminum is the poster child for that. So you want to know aluminum is acidic, iron is slightly less acidic, and then there are a few others that give a very fringe amount of acidity. Uh, however, D is something that's worth investigating. So we have NaHCO2, uh, this is sodium bicarbonate, which has a pH above 7. So this is acidic and basic, but has a basic interaction with water. Uh, but this one, what is this? So COO2 means we have a carboxylic acid and we have a hydrogen present. So a lot of people might get kind of suckered into that. But this hydrogen is actually attached to the carbon. It's not acidic. And it's the negative charge over here where the sodium is and therefore it's a deprotonated one, so this is methanoate, uh, and therefore that is also basic. So basic, basic, maybe slightly acidic, definitely acidic, age your best choice.